Hey, what's up, nerds? It is Paul at Radio Free Hammer Hall. Welcome back to the Warforge. And today, we're going to talk about this crazy mess. One of the cool tricks that you can do when you're painting pretty much anything, especially with acrylic paints, is to use an undercoat of a color and then paint your actual color that you want over that to modify the effect of the final color on whatever you're painting. So, what I did here was create a big old color swatch of a big variety of different colors and different undercoats to see what it was all going to look like in the end. Now, this is actually something that I've been kind of looking for for a while. Um, and undercoating is something that a lot of painters talk about. They'll say, you know, it's great to undercoat color X with Y. And it really does create a great effect for those things. But I never found like a guide for like well everything so i thought i would make a resource like that and talk about it and share it with people and kind of go through you can either how you can either make one yourself like this guy or uh, i'll just drop a link down in the description to uh the photo of this so that you can just download it and have it as a resource. I know for me, I'm just going to be keeping this thing around. It's probably just going to go up on the wall at some point just uh, for reference because this is really useful. So what did I do with this thing? How did I create this? Um, I just started with a one foot square piece of then I just took my favorite black primer and primed the whole thing black then I just took my airbrush and kind of went nuts I painted stripes as you can see here going you know just about halfway across I got a little overzealous and went a little over halfway with some of them so this column over here is a little narrower than the other side, so I didn't get quite as many examples in there as I would have liked. I then went through and, like, by hand, painted on a variety of different colors as examples for what different colors are going to look like with different undercoating. So, what colors did I choose here and why? Well, you'll see that most of this here is pretty light colors. Uh, my understanding of this was basically that lighter colors with a more subtle, uh, with a more subtle colored pigment to them are going to give you a good effect and it's not going to really push the color dramatically in a certain direction it might uh, it might improve the general color and tone uh, or you know it, adjust it in a certain way to get the effect that you want on your miniature but it's not uh, overpowering it's letting the actual paint you do use, it's letting the actual paint you use do the majority of the work and that's just augmenting it. Now, how and why does this trick work at all? Well, miniature paints are typically acrylics. They're usually pretty thin versions of acrylics and some even thinner than others depending on what brand or type of paint that you're using. That said, because they're thin paints and just by the nature of acrylic paints in general, they're pretty translucent. So to really get them to be totally opaque, you usually need to do a couple of coats of that paint to totally cover up 
whatever's underneath it. So that allows us to put something underneath and have that show through just a little bit so that it's going to act sort of like a filter for the color that you put over it. Why did I then select the colors that I did specifically? Here's, you know, a selection of pretty common things and a few general colors that I had already sort of heard of and knew about that uh, I wanted to try out here. And for the individual little stripes, I went, started over here and just went with basic rainbow colors, uh, then had a few other things, some washes and some shades and, uh, Finally in there, there's some contrast paints. Uh, all of the regular acrylic paints uh, were all pro acryl, and then I think everything else pretty much was Games Workshop Citadel paints. So it's a little bit difficult to see when I'm just holding the thing up. So I will get you a close-up picture of this thing and throw it on the screen so that you have a better idea of what we're looking at. And maybe if I'm feeling not lazy, I will even uh, put some things up that are a little bit zoomed in, a more detailed view, so you get a better idea. All right, so the top layer was just a straight titanium white undercoat. This is theoretically just going to give you like the true color, I guess, of the paint. So you'll see here that it's giving you pretty bright versions of all of these colors because the... below that I went through some other light colors that are more or less in the gray sort of spectrum uh, some light grays, warm, cold, uh, ivory, khaki, uh, light flesh tone. And then at the bottom here, I did a very, very pale yellow, a pale blue, pink, and a pale flesh color. Uh, over on the other side, I did a pale green. And then I went into colors that were a bit darker uh, with some browns and ruddy tones in here, purple, magenta, and cyan, because those are, are also really powerful, important colors. It's kind of like your alternate color wheel, the one that you didn't learn in school that actually is a lot of times much more useful. Um, and then you'll see the giant splotch of yellow. And let's have a quick conversation about the color yellow. Um, Yellow is very difficult to work with. When you're using acrylic paints, you're already working with something that is naturally translucent. It's a translucent medium. When you add a pigment to that, like yellow, yellow is a very translucent pigment, which makes your final product not at all opaque, right? So if you try to put a single thin coat of yellow over pretty much anything that has color to it, it is just going to radically change that color yellow. And because I was just throwing yellow over black primer on this, it was terrible. Oh, wow. And then my efforts to make it better by adding more coats, I got a bit impatient and overzealous and um, I hate yellow. I have a whole maggot kin ar army and Slaves of Darkness army where all the armor is yellow and I hate yellow. I've done it too much. I'm traumatized. Great story. Compelling and rich. Anyway, I am going to just kind of move on here. So there's a variety of things that we can observe looking at this. 
because of just the way that I laid this out, it's a little bit more difficult to kind of look down across the different undershades for the various different colors and see how that one color is differently affected by various different undershades. As I mentioned a minute ago, the titanium white is giving you a very bright version of the color. Then as we move down through these other colors that are kind of in the gray white sort of family, you'll see that they have a bit of a subtle effect on the color that's coming through. The grays in particular are kind of toning down that brightness with kind of having the same effect of getting the color itself to come out, but it's just a bit darker. It doesn't pop quite as much. When we move down into the khaki color and the ivory, that starts actually really picking up the yellow pigments in there a lot. I was very, very surprised with the khaki, just how much that was adjusting the color in the final coat. Let's look at the bright yellow. It's like a pale yellow that we have in here. You'll see that as we go across these colors, it does have a bit of an effect but it's not that drastic. The interesting thing is the khaki right above it does seem to have a more dramatic effect. It's on a number of the lighter colors, it's really leeching the life out of those colors. One of the big things that I noticed going across all of these different color combinations was that when you look at colors and think about them by temperature, that is like warm colors and cool colors, if you have a warm undercoat and a warm base color that you put over it, it tends to emphasize the richness of that warm color. And if you use a cold color with uh, a cold undertone, it emphasizes the coolness of that color. If you kind of invert them, have a cool and a warm or a warm and a cool, then it kind of like desaturates that color and makes it a bit more dull. Boring. But that dullness definitely has a lot of uses. One of the other things that we notice here is that when you bring colors together that are at opposite ends of the color wheel, so for example, a blue going against a, what would be on the other end of the color wheel from that? If you have a blue and an orange together, that's going to really, really desaturate those colors. They're opposites on that color spectrum. So it's when you just mix those two colors together, it's basically going to make brown. Having the base, uh, having an undercoat of one of those colors and having your base layer of the opposite over the top that's really gonna kind of pull that color towards a brownish kind of tone. One of the more useful applications of this idea, I think, are looking at the flesh tone sorts of colors and how we can use these undercoats to adjust the flesh tones on your miniature. The flesh tones all have a pretty significant effect from having an undercoated color. They go from being the sort of a pinky, peachy sort of tone when you, they're just against the bright white. And as you go down, it really picks up a tremendous amount of the color that's underneath that. 
So this is really a quick and easy way when you have a large army and you want to vary the skin tones a little bit throughout the army to make each model just look a little bit different so they're not just, I don't know, all clones of each other basically. Um, this gives you an opportunity to kind of use the same basic like Caucasian skin tone base color by using a different undershade, you can really make that skin tone appear quite different. And for example, using these tones that are more in the dark flesh or brown sort of spectrum, you can really get some much darker looking skin tones. So I think this is really kind of a good cheat for varying your skin tones and getting stuff that looks more interesting. Also here, if this is a great way to look and see, you know, if I'm going to do a vampire or a ghoul or a zombie. Woohoo! I'm a vampire! <laughs> you are not, though. Any number of things where you have really pale sort of flesh that is either kind of lifeless, dead, whatever. You can see that if you're using cool undertones and also like the grays, that is going to pull that color through and it's going to make that flesh tone look much less alive. Meanwhile, if you use, uh, meanwhile, if you use tones that are more in the family of reds and oranges, which are basically the primary sorts of pigments that would be in a flesh tone anyway, they really bring that out more and emphasize it and make those like brighter tones. All right, so I think that is basically it for now on this color swatch sort of idea and undershading. So, I, all right, so I think that is it for now on undershading. This is an almost comprehensive kind of guide to undershading. And I think the big thing is going to be, take a look at the link in the description to look at the image of the actual panel that I did to see what the actual colors look like closer up in a still image so you can do a little compare and contrast and just experiment with this a bit yourself. I would imagine that different brands of paint, different types of paint are going to have a bit of a different effect. So like many things in miniature painting, it's going to be a lot of trial and error. But hopefully this gets you kind of a good start and a good guide and you can just kind of go from here. Get some ideas and then go have some fun. I'll talk to you all later. All right. One of the more useful, uh, one of the more useful uses, that sounds fucking dumb. be on.